Hello, my name is Lamari, and I'm the community manager for the Decentralized Identity Foundation. The foundation, otherwise known as DIFF, is developing specifications for a new identity ecosystem. Today, I'm joined by Taran Gar, the CEO and founder of a cybersecurity company called QuickFox. His company became associate members of DIFF in the past year, and he will be sharing more with us about his product and his journey in the decentralized identity landscape. If you are interested in becoming an associate member of DIFF, please go to identity.foundation where you can learn more. I hope you enjoy the interview. So, uh, first of all, I wanna welcome you, Taryn. Thank you so much for joining me today and having this discussion. And um, I must say, when I spoke to you a few months ago, when you went through your short demo on QuickFox, I was actually really excited about what you guys are doing. So I'm really glad we get to, the, to hear this discussion and go a little bit more in depth on what you guys are doing. Um, and so first, what I always like to do when I start out is I, I like to hear people's story. Um, everyone in this community is so interesting um, and decentralized identity. It is a space which is relatively new and it would be great to just get a sense of your journey, how you came to work on QuickFox um, and also um, decentralized identity generally. So maybe you can just um, give us a little bit of an introduction on that. Absolutely. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for having us here. Um, you know, very excited to be part of being an associate member at uh, uh, DIF. So, um, uh, as far as my story is concerned, you know, I, I've worked for companies like Deloitte, AOL, Microsoft, and I've been all over the place. I'm an engineer by profession, never been a business guy, but somehow by default got into entrepreneurship. Uh, I left my Microsoft to start my own software consulting firm, grew it to around 500 people, and then I had a successful exit from it. And then... Um, so QuickFox was my uh, favorite project since my college days. You know, I always had this feeling that uh, something is drastically wrong with the internet. And uh, it's very information driven. And obviously the technologies were not there. Uh, uh, and, and early on, uh, you know, Web 1.0 was very information driven. So since college days, I wanted to build an internet browser and a horizontal platform. And that's how uh, ultimately man, woman, machine came together. You know, I had the resources to do it this time around. The hardware and software was now up to the par. I could build very immersive experiences. And the technology, a lot of technology was open source. So I said, oh, this is the right time to do it. And we are kind of sitting at the beginning of the end of the first era of uh, of the internet. So I think this is the perfect time to do it. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, and if you can give us maybe just a bit of an overview of what QuickFox is, that would be great. Absolutely, so um, we, we love to call ourselves as the trustworthy internet company, uh, which practically means that we are building a tool chain for the trustworthy internet. And as part of that, we are solving two problems. Fix what is broken in Web 2.0, which is safety, security, and privacy. And second, design the future, which practically means build a more, more democratic, equitable, and decentralized internet. Um, you know, in the past, peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, computing has been tried before, or decentralized web has been tried before, and it did not fail because we could not connect computers together. It practically failed because we could not contain spam. You know, if, for example, you have BitTorrent and uh, you download BitTorrent uh, content from BitTorrent, you can't put a finger on who, <laughs> what are you downloading from and, uh, and what the content is all about. It could be malware, it could be a key logger, it could be anything. So we thought, you know, uh, we have this set of problems in Web 2.0, safety, security, and privacy, and we are dragging all these problems to Web 3.0 you know, with all the hoopla around privacy and trust, you know, we thought you cannot solve privacy without solving safety and security. And we thought you need a horizontal platform to do that. 
And honestly, we were uh, the more we kind of researched other browsers, we realized that you know there were some basic problems that other browsers were not solving that we had an opportunity to solve at QuickFox. And that's how it transpired. You know, a number of our team members they've worked with with me in the past, so we thought it might be a great idea to get together and uh, fix this once and for all. And the icing on the cake was that my mother got scammed uh, for six hundred dollars. <laughs> Uh, some time back and uh, her running joke was that, hey, you're good for nothing. You can't fix this problem for me and all other moms. I'm like, okay, mom, let's fix this problem for everybody. <laughs> let's make internet more safe, trustworthy and reliable. And that's what we are doing at QuickFox practically. Yeah, that's great. And I know there are a number of browsers that may claim you know, to be security browsers. It would be great if you can give us also a bit of an idea of what makes QuickFox different from other security browsers that are out there that people can choose from. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, tongue in cheek, I generally tend to say that uh, we don't consider other browsers to be our competitors. We consider every other horizontal platform to be our competitor. For example, um, I think Google is our competitor. Uh, we think uh, Microsoft is our competitor. Apple is our competitor. We don't consider Opera or uh, Brave to be a competitive competitor per se. Because uh, um, our intention was to build a platform that that is designed for a uh, trustworthy internet. Doesn't matter whether you are centralized or decentralized, whether you're using Web2 technologies, Web 2.5 technologies or Web 3.0 technologies, you know, we had a feeling that uh, the, the consumer is not getting a consumer friendly, reliable experience. So that's where we kind of delineate ourselves from uh, the likes of Brave and what have you. So their claim to fame is practically that uh, we take care of privacy. But as, as I mentioned before, um, we think that you cannot solve privacy if you don't solve safety and security. I'll give you a simple example. You, uh, you have an email from a phishing website, you click on that website and you willingly provide all your information, there goes your privacy out of the window. If the browser does not have the technology to identify that the, the, the entity you are dealing with is not a legitimate business or you are not uh, interacting with a reliable uh, second or a third party, then your privacy is not secured. So we jokingly say that, you know, privacy is the new Kool-Aid these days. You know, everybody talks about privacy, but very, privacy, but very few know how to fix it. And then uh, safety, security, privacy, you know, uh, uh, I always had this opinion that, you know, uh, it's, uh, that uh, things like honesty, integrity are not your speciality. They should be there by default. So safety, security, and privacy is not a speciality that you design the platform around. It is a prerequisite, you know, and, and then comes the things that you want to do. For example, we want to design the future. We want uh, uh, anybody, uh, we want a consumer to be able to kind of be able to create an online shop with a click of a button. We want them to be able to find each other uh, very easily. Uh, we want them to be able to uh, to verify each other's identity easily. You know, we want them to feel private and then be anonymous if they want to. But at the same time, uh, uh, share information at the point of use. And that's where decentralized identity was a critical building block for us. We couldn't have done this without decentralized identity because, you know, uh, uh, read, write, own internet kind of practically starts and ends at uh, creating these building blocks in the horizontal platform. Mm -hmm. So in short, you know, um, uh, it's quite a mouthful, but, uh, you know, I love to say it uh, uh, in a more simple manner that we are solving the problems, uh, the fundamental problems that exist in internet today and then build pleasant, consumer-friendly, centralized, as well as decentralized experiences for the consumers for the future. That's how I would put it. So that's where I think we we deviate from all other browsers like, like Firefox, Opera, Brave, etc. Yeah, when I spoke to you months ago, you mentioned that this was a decentralized browser that's included, that it's a cybersecurity system and a feature of it is, is the browser that has decentralized identity baked into it. Um, 
and you described it as, you know, once you have access to it, you can access all of your, your various accounts. Can you maybe give us like a little bit of a summary for some of our audience of kind of how that might work? Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, uh, very early on in my career, when we were, um, you know, in one of my incarnations at Microsoft, um, I used to work with the telecom uh, providers and uh, with telecom providers, they were latching on to data networks. And it was all almost always about the applications that you can bring on a platform. At the end of the day, a platform is as, as successful as the applications that you built on it. And decentralized identity is uh, one such, uh, you know, paradigm that if you don't have a working active application for it, it is very difficult for the consumer to understand the difference between password manager and identity manager. You know, and you see that in decentralized apps, you know, they're in a decimal state today. Uh, you know, uh, more than 4,000 decentralized app, uh, their average active users are 699. You look at 350 identity wallets and practically when you open the application, it's completely empty. So we thought, uh, you know, uh, having an identity wallet uh, singularly and separately and in an isolated fashion does not make sense unless you are Apple or Google. Uh, so where do you kind of put, put your identity wallet? Identity wallet has to be at the point of use and you have to make the transition for the consumer seamless from using a password manager to be able to use decentralized identity or using their verifiable credential uh, as part of that uh, workflow. So we have around four different reference applications uh, um, you know, that we have built. One of them is a collaboration engine like Zoom uh, another one uh, is uh, an, an inbuilt antivirus. Then the third one uh, is a smart stacks application, which is our answer to IPFS. So all these uh, uh, technologies put together, they all use decentralized identity. For example, if you log in into, uh, you have a profile created in our browser and you want to log in into any of these applications, you don't have to do anything. You know, it's one simple uh, question is asked, asked that, you know, this service provider is asking for so-and-so information. You click yes, and then you are logged in automatically because that exchange between the identity wallet and the service provider happens automatically. The consumer, for consumer, it is as simple as just clicking on the password manager and selecting the password. And this is the experience that we wanted to kind of get to. Uh, we had a simple philosophy that if we can't make it simple for the consumers, throw it in the dustbin. You know, uh, uh, the, at the end of the day, the browser needs to be used by the consumers and small businesses alike. You know, another reasoning was that um, how do you how do you bring it to the masses? How do you make sure that uh, uh, identity systems become integral part of next generation experiences? You know, and that's where uh, while we were working on building these, uh, reducing the entry barrier for consumers to create a website, to build a shop, you know, all those experiences, identity becomes an integral fundamental part of it. So we wanted to make sure that it is inbuilt into the browser. So today, I mean, uh, all you need to do is you'll go to uh, the browser. There is an application called antivirus, which is inbuilt into the browser. You click on that anti antivirus. Uh, your identity is automatically shared, uh, your subscription is validated, and if your subscription is still valid, uh, and it all, everything happens with decentralized identity, then you get access to the application or, you know, and we've taken care of those advanced use cases like revocation lists and uh, ensuring privacy for the consumer, not going back to the issuer, and so and so uh, forth. But all of it is completely transparent to the consumer. Consumer just think, oh, just another password manager. Right. And I know you mentioned that your mother was one of the individuals who fell prey to uh, the uh, fraud, you know, cybersecurity fraud. And the um, boomer generation you mentioned was really your primary market. These are the primary people who were coming to you to use QuickFox. And that makes sense because we all, you know, my parents are boomers. Um, you know, a lot of us, we've experienced this. 
you know, we see it all the time, strange links that get sent from people, you know, you know, they've been hacked. Um, and so I, I'm curious to hear more about how you see this then moving into other markets or what's your vision of kind of where you see Quick Fox going and how it may change the way people do things and think about things. Absolutely. You know, um, uh, you know, and, and and I think this is something, well, first thing, yes, my mother, uh, you know, I, I had a, I had an earful from her after she got scammed uh, and it was all my fault because I was supposedly an IT guy and I had to fix it. I bet, how can she get scammed from her computer? And uh, uh, that's how it started. But uh, as far as baby boomers is concerned, it was our beachhead market because we realized that, you know, uh, there are 73 million baby boomers in the United States, around 46 million are on internet every single day. And out of them, 21 million purchase an antivirus subscription. So we realized that, you know, if, uh, uh, if we can enter this market and we can, uh, we can safeguard baby boomers from getting scammed, that will give us a lot of credibility to kind of branch out in uh, to SMBs and then ultimately go towards megacorps and then ultimately open up other verticals and other customer segments. So that was the plan. But if you kind of go to our website today and you look at the message, uh, it's a very simple message. It says the browser that keeps you safe. You know, um, uh, it brings you peace of mind. And this is the message for the for the consumers who who have not yet latched on to the crypto bus or who have not latched to the Web3, you know, uh, marketing buzzwords. I mean, these are the consumers who use internet every single day and they are concerned uh, uh, that, you know, uh, they may get scammed or their credit card information will be stolen. So these are the consumers that uh, we thought are a primary market and uh, all across the planet. And you know what is surprising when we kind of started doing our market research, we started to realize that it is not the baby boomers who are buying the product. It's actually their kids who are buying it for their parents. So uh, kids are like, oh, this seems very interesting. I mean, this browser is able to identify that uh, uh, domain name, uh, if you kind of browse to a domain name, that whether it is a legitimate business in the United States or not. So uh, that in itself, this one simple tweak uh, to, the, to the platform actually safeguards consumers, I mean, from 90% of the threats. Uh, you know, and, uh, but as far as our uh, future is concerned, I think our future is all about Web3. You know, uh, we've kind of identified the value proposition when it comes to uh, the regular consumers. Uh, you know, that's the browser that keeps you safe. Now, the browser of the future is where we, uh, we uh, in 2023 and 2024, that's where we are working in two, in two different segments. One, we want to make sure that we redefine what a browser means for small and medium businesses. And second, uh, we kind of enable this decentralized trustworthy web3 you know um that's where i kind of say that you know uh, blockchain is generally a small tool chain or blockchain is practically a, a data structure you know blockchain is not decentralized internet decentralized internet means you and i can connect with each other we can share in information we can share conversations we can have uh, perform transactions and then finally we can share experiences now if we can do all these four things then we are actually laying the foundation of next generation decentralized fragmented internet and i think uh, we are getting there one step at a time and all this churn that we are seeing in web3 industry right now is is an essential part of it you know uh, through this churn will come out the winners and the losers absolutely um and thank you for sharing all that um the other question i do have is specifically about diff what what brought you to diff you know i always like i'm curious kind of you know, how you came across us, um, you know, if there are any work items that that were of interest to you at your company, um, you know, groups that you enjoy attending or members of your team enjoy, um, would just be great to hear your thoughts on that. 
Well, uh, I think we've always been curious. So uh, we, we were kind of following two different tracks uh, uh, when it came to decentralized identity and creating decentralized profiles. Uh, you know, um, there is another school of thought that thinks that, you know, rather than decentralized identity, you can just have NFPs, which is, you know, uh, non-fungible profiles. Uh, and kind of just post them on blockchain and use them as a, a as a springboard to kind of uh, define identity. But I've been uh, throughout my career, I've been a, a standards junkie. You know, I, I very early on you understood, right? So if you make a lock for yourself, it should work for everybody else. Otherwise, you're the only one using the lock. So, <laughs> so the key has to work for everybody. So I think that's where the standard uh, standards bodies come in. And uh, but I think the biggest help that comes from DIF is that the establish uh, establishing of standards, writing of specs, creating use cases. We have practically used it as a, uh, as our PRDs to kind of build our because our focus was building the internet. You know the trustworthy internet. So we wanted to make, you know, if we had to kind of build this entire set of uh, the architectural paradigms, the security and and the specifications and the use cases around decentralized identity, it would have taken us another two years to do it. So thanks to the entire community and, uh, you know, uh, we keep on following uh, uh, all the, almost all the specs, uh, you know, we kind of passively follow. So thanks to the entire community for the amazing work that everybody has done uh, to kind of bring us to this point. And, uh, uh, but it's amusing to sometimes see, I mean, uh, see our implementation and then ultimately see uh, the specifications that happen at DIF and uh, all the debates that go around. One, one of the sticky points still that we have is the revocation lists, how to deal with revocation lists. So that's where we are very curious. Uh, uh, we are also very curious to see how Google and uh, uh, and Apple react to it, and uh, what is their roadmap in in terms of uh, implementing it in their browsers. Uh, well, we are not complaining because we already have it today. You know, as I was mentioning to you last time around, we say that Jack Jack Dorsey has a spec for five, five uh, Web five. We have a product that does all of that today. You know, we're not complaining, you know, I mean, Google and Microsoft and Apple can take their own sweet time <laughs> debating whether they're going to go the decentralized identity route or not. But I think this, um, the speed with which we've been able to implement uh, the decentralized identity, it's all thanks to DIF. And um, well, um, you, if you're checked in into, uh, into the future, you have to know what's happening in, in identity space identity is fundamental to any horizontal platform so, so i can't really recall how i know about dif but let's just say i just know it from day one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right if you're in the space you come across it eventually yeah right. and and that's great to share because it is a great place for you to just come in i mean you can get your hands on the code or you can just watch uh, you, you know you can get into the github repos you can if you're members they can join our slack channel and we have great discussions that are happening there all the time oh and, and there is one more thing that i wanted to mention uh quickly well uh decentralized identity when combined with quantum resistant resistant cryptography is amazing and uh we, i guess we are the only browser that has actually ensured that both these technologies are in so we are today the only browser that has, if your, your server can support quantum resistant cryptography, our browser supports it today. So uh, this is what we are doing for the enterprises to kind of make them more safe and secure. Great. Thanks for sharing. I'm sure a lot of people in our audience would be very interested in that. So, so that really brings us to the end of things. It was really great to speak with you today, Taryn. And lastly, can you give people a sense of how they, if they want to follow up with you, um, if they want to learn more about QuickFox, what's the best way to do that? QuickFox.com. Uh, my name is Tarun Gaur. Uh, I'm available on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, you know, uh, till we build our own social network as part of the browser or as part of the super app. Uh, yeah, 
I can, I'm reachable uh, and I'm busy to nothing. And if you've got an amazing use case, I, I would love to hear from you. If I can be of any help to anybody in the community, um, would love to do that. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today. This was a great interview and I look forward to being in touch. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks again.